Hello and welcome to a special Juneteenth episode of the Black Dog Sports Podcast. I am your host, Arthur Hosey Jr., class of 2008, and I'm joined by uh, Mississippi State Athletic Director, Mr. John Cohen. Some people call him Coach, some people call him AD. He says that we should just call him John, so that's what we're going to do, okay? So, um, as we all know, he was the former Mississippi State baseball coach, a uh, former baseball coach at uh, University of Kentucky, also the, uh, well, actually a member of the Diamond Dogs back in the day. Um, so, um, that's, that's, that's the things to know about him. We already know about that. The guy that led us to the National Championship Series back in 2013. It was great. I loved every moment of it. And um, before we get into that, we're going to go ahead and introduce the guys. I'm going to start off with Mr. Derek Hummus. What's happening? What's on your mind today? Oh, man, it's, it's Juneteenth Friday. You know, I'm just ready for the weekend. Glad to have uh, John Cohen on to talk Mississippi State sports. But are you throwing anything on the grill? No. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> You know what? That's that's okay. That's fine. I'm gonna All let right. you be the grill master this show. All right. So this next person. Oh boy. <sighs> this next man is a close personal friend of mine. <sighs> I remember back when he didn't have his driver's license, and I personally had to teach him how to drive coming back from Humphrey Coliseum. Mr. Jeremiah <laughs> Short. What's going on with you? Pretty much, man. Just decided to do the interview, man. Let's uh, get it started. Right, right, right. So I'm I'm proud of the fact that, you know, we had uh, Coach Leach on, and now we actually have John Cohen on. It's like, oh, my God, you know. So uh, we're going to ask him some tough questions. But the first thing that we're going to start off with is that we want you to talk about yourself. Tell us briefly about your mm -hmm. coaching career um, for the listeners who don't know you as a coach. Gosh, I, I think the guys, the thing I can say, the most prevalent word I can think of is, just really fortunate and blessed. I, I've been in the right place at the right time from, from a child all, all the way to adulthood. Um, I've had great experiences. I've been part of five wonderful institutions. I got the chance to come back home here to Mississippi State where I've always wanted to be. Um, you know, I, I, I say this to people all the time. It's amazing. As a player, like, I got hits against Mississippi State and for Mississippi State. As a coach – I have beaten Mississippi State and lost to Mississippi State. So I, I have so many different vantage points in my career, uh, like in the other dugout or in the Mississippi State dugout. So I, I feel like I have a unique vantage point. And, uh, again, just really, really feel blessed that, that uh, I, I get to do what I've always wanted to do every single day uh, here at Mississippi State. Okay. So um, well, I remember when the Clarion Ledger first prematurely broke that you were going to be the AD. That was like, for me, it was a bit like he's getting into being an AD. You know, I didn't think it was anything strange about it, but at the same time, it's like, I know he's a darn good baseball coach. So I, how did you first get into the, um, I guess, the – line of thought that led to you becoming an AD? Like, you know, and what's the difference between those two hats of being a coach versus being an AD? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, when I was hired here in 2008, the summer of 2008, heading into 2009, at the end of the football season, Greg Byrne called me up and he said, hey, I, I need you to, to be on an airplane. It was a Sunday. He said, I need you to be on an airplane with me Sunday afternoon. And I said, what, what's going on? And he told me that they were going to be hunting for a football coach. And I said, Greg, I really appreciate this. I'm honored. I'm thrilled to be a part of this. But why me? Why, why am I part of this? And he said, that's really simple, John. You're the only coach I've ever hired. Meaning that I want you to be able to tell anybody that we interview that they can trust me and the type of person I am because you knew me at Kentucky now you know me at Mississippi State, and I got to kind of sit in the back of the room for interviews uh, for football coaches. I, I wasn't one of the people interviewing. I just got to be part of it and answer any questions that the candidates had at that time. And from that moment forward, Scott Strickland uh, involved me in the process, and Mitch Barnhart at the University of Kentucky 
allowed me to be part of the process of administration at times. He let me, you know, sneak a peek into the room when, when they were making some really uh, important decisions. And, and again, I don't want anybody to think that I was making those decisions because I wasn't, but just being a part of it really intrigued me and it made me want to, uh, to enter that side of athletics and administration. Okay. Um, Jeremiah, you had anything you want to add to it? Well, I guess, I guess now that we're kind of talking about him becoming an AD and, you know, getting into that role, talk about, I guess, some of your first few hires um, and really just hiring your replacement. How was that having to re hire someone to replace you? I mean, that's, that obviously you running the program as your baby. So hiring someone to kind of take your role. Yeah, that was an interesting process. Just because of the time of year, guys, it was November, um, late October and November. So in, in the baseball world, that, that's when you're wrapping up your fall practice. So it was a little bit uh, unique in that way. And, you know, our players, um, I, they were on a little bit of a roller coaster, and I appreciate their patience. And I really appreciated the way they handled themselves. Um, you know, we, we had three straight years where we played in a super regional or better um, actually four straight years, which I, one of the elite schools in the, in the country that's been able to do that. So um, it was a unique time. It, it was a lot of phone calls. I, I had no idea if I was going to get this position or not, but I did know that I was going to have to have a coaching candidate in my, in my pocket if I was going to have a chance to be the athletic director. And that's exactly, uh, that's exactly how it went down. Well, and kind of through a lot of unfortunate circumstances, you kind of went through a few baseball coaches over those course of years. So tell me how you dealt with all of that. I mean, one of them, a couple, one was very controversial then, one interim, then now you have a guy. So tell me what qualities you were looking for, you know, going, I guess, going through that process, you know, to, you've had to hire essentially a couple of baseball coaches. Like, tell me yeah, how I, you kind of like waded through those waters. I appreciate the, the question. I mean, it, it you know, it, it's amazing. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, when I went through the process, and I'm a, I'm a note taker, I, I, you know, at the time, we, we felt like we were making the best decision for Mississippi State. Unfortunately, you know, things happen. Um, mm -hmm. and some, you know, some, some things that obviously I can't comment about. But, um, yeah, I, it, was, it was unfortunate. Um, but at the same time, we, we had to make a really tough decision. Um, I'd like to think that I'm not a hard headed person. And when I write it all down and I have I, really good people around me that to, to help me make decisions, um, you know, we just, we make the decisions we feel like are the, are the best in the best interest of Mississippi State University. So even though there's been some tough times in the AD chair, I, I feel like we've, we, we've made good decisions. What about, I mean, I guess ultimately you made a decision. Um, a lot of people thought maybe you should have kept the interim coach and then you decided we're going to go with this guy so talk about that decision even though you had pressure to kind of and it made sense maybe even to stick with one person to make that ultimate decision as an organization that we're going to go we're just going to get the person that's the right fit yeah again i i think that's my my charge as an athletic director is to make the you know the tough decisions gary henderson close friend um the minute i came back to mississippi state i told mitch barnhart he he should hire gary henderson because Gary did a great job with that program uh, at, at Kentucky. He was a big part of the reason we won the Southeastern Conference in 2006, for first time in program history. Love Gary um, I, I, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, I, I felt like we needed to go in a different direction. That was tough because Gary did such a great job in the interim title, leading our team to the College World Series. So. Uh, yeah, that was tough also, but there's no doubt in my mind that Chris Lamonis was the right choice. And I think, you know, his first year at Mississippi State, he wins 52 games, guys. Mm -hmm. That's more wins than any coach in the history of the SEC in their first year in any sport. So I, I think Chris has proven himself as a great recruiter. I think he's proven himself as somebody who really understands the game. And I, I think he's poised really – to have a chance to win our first national championship in any sport at Mississippi State. So, uh, and I know Derek has a question, but I have a follow up to that. So take me in just the eighties head. I know as a coach, sometimes when you pick a player that other people don't necessarily believe in or don't agree with your decision to bring me in, you're almost like after that player succeeds, you're like, probably like, yeah, you know, I told you this guy was good. So how is that as an AD when you have all these people criticizing you 
or essentially making a tough call like that. Is there part of you, maybe you don't say it outwardly in an interview, but part of you in your office, you're like, I think I'm going to make a decision. Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up because just recently, you know, we had our two first round dra draft picks, uh, Foskey and Westberg. I will mm -hmm. tell you guys, those two guys were not highly recruited. And neither one of them were drafted in a 40-round draft that encompasses 1,200-plus amateur players. And they mm -hmm. come to Mississippi State, and they both become first-round draft picks. Will Coggin was my recruiting coordinator. He believed in those two guys. We got them in here. We talked to them. They signed with Mississippi State. I remember being in Jordan Westberg's home just in Texas. Um, yeah, I, I think in some ways – um, it, it's a little gratifying when things work out. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't think you have the attitude of, you know, sticking your chest out because you realize that at any point in time, anything <laughs> can happen. And yes. that's the crazy world we live in. We live in interesting times and you don't know what's next. But you do know that you got to write it all down. You got to get all the information you can. You got to make the best decision you can. Right. Um, now I want to talk about your time as a player. Um, I didn't get a chance to see you play much. So when I found out we were having you, well, I was a kid, I was 10 years old in the 90 team. So I did some video, coach. You could swing that at bat. <laughs> yeah, it was it was fun to play at Mississippi State. You know, I wanted to be Will Clark or Rafael Palmero. I wanted to be Tony Gwynn. I, I wanted to be so many guys. I think that was one of my issues is um, I was really fixated on being somebody other than myself. That's a lesson I had to learn as a kid. Um, you know, I, I think we all try and mature as best we can, 18 to 22 years old. You know, we, we get a ton of input from our student athletes. They have great ideas. They have great feel for what's going on. They're so much more mature than I was uh, at the same age. But you know what, guys? We were held to a different type of standard back then. If we had a bad game, we weren't going to come home to – a thousand tweets at us saying that <laughs> we weren't very good. And that's what our athletes have to deal with now. You know, when right. you didn't play well back then or you lost a game, you just went home and said, hey, we'll go get them tomorrow or whenever we play next. Our players have to deal with a whole different type of reality in our country, around the world, and quite frankly, with social media. I'm, I'm one of these people that contends that, you know, the iPhone is maybe the, the best thing and the worst thing that's happened to our mm -hmm. society. Um, the iPhone can be true. It gets, you know, the iPhone can film things that are happening in real time to bring light, to bring the truth to the world. But it also, in social media, can bring hatred and it can bring racism and it can bring other things uh, that, that aren't great to the world as well. So um, I, I love modern technology, but I think, I, I think we have to learn from what its positives are and definitely what its negatives are as well. All right. So I said all of that, not talking about me as a player, because guys, <laughs> I, you know, I was just an above average, probably SEC player who worked really hard and was really fortunate to be around great people. Guys, my, my four years at Mississippi State, I think I played for eight different coaches who went on to become Division I head coaches. That's how good Ron Polk was at putting the right people around us. And of course, he's, he's a guy who won 13. 1,800 games a head coach here at Mississippi State as well. But you were drafted okay. as well. Now, I'm going to go a little bit off script, and this is something that I have to ask. Is what is it like to come in and follow in the footsteps of a giant, you know, the father of SEC baseball, Mississippi State baseball, all that good stuff? Uh, Ron Paul, what is it like to come behind that? Well, it, it's certainly difficult. Um in some ways. Um, and I think the circumstances here were, were strange. You guys might remember Coach Polk really wanted Tommy Raffo to be the head coach at Mississippi State. That's, that's been pretty well documented. I respect <laughs> that. That says a lot about who Coach Polk is. He's a loyal guy. Tommy worked for him for a long time. You know, I, I kind of get this feel. It's like, like Tommy uh, Raffo was the loyal son, the guy who stayed here, worked his tail off, did a great job at Mississippi State. John Cohen might have been the rebellious son of Ron Polk who ran off and tried to make his own way in the world. Two different paths. One's not wrong. One's not right. I think if Tommy would have been selected, he would have been an excellent coach here. 
But guys, make no mistake about it, I was not going to turn down this opportunity. I consider mm -hmm. Starkville home. I'm, I, I feel so privileged to be a part of this great university. And yeah, I was going to take the, the job, whether Coach Polk felt like it was appropriate or not. And, you know, we, we had some great conversations. Not all of them were pleasant, but I, I always say this and I mean it. I don't know how y'all's families are, but my family is a family and we don't always get along. We don't always say things that other people in our family appreciate but we're still a family when we still have each other's back. And that's how I feel about coach Polk. And I feel like I can't speak for him, but that's how I feel like he feels about me. And uh, that's part of being the Mississippi state family. Right. And I feel as though that when coach burn, um, well, when whatever happened with coach Polk happened, um, I think that it took some stones to say the least. And that's kind of sometimes the vibe that I get off of you is that sometimes you're willing to make the tough decision, the best decision for Mississippi State, not necessarily what the fans uh, want, but I think that you do what is overall in the best interest of the program, regardless of if the fans know it or not. And well, um, <laughs> go ahead, Jim. No, no, what I was going to say, I think that's a perfect fit, segue. I mean, it's probably not the nicest part of the interview, I guess. Uh, we kind of wanted to get into, I guess, Joe Moorhead. That's kind of been one of the most talked about times, I guess, during your tenure. So I guess it's kind of a two-part question. First, kind of talk about, and I think I've read in previous interviews, you're very big on recruiting, which everybody really should be, but with Moorhead, um, you know, hiring him, he's a very relationship-driven guy. So talk about, you know, why you initially uh, decided to hire Moorhead. What did you see in him? And then ultimately, um, it's kind of been belabored why, you know, you don't let him go. But talk about, you know, hiring him, then ultimately having to let him go. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Joe had great credentials coming in. Um, you know, Mississippi State is one of those positions where it's certainly not a plug-and-play type situation. It's, it's got to be the right fit. Um, of course, Joe was a national offensive coordinator of the year. Um, Dan Mullen was a great offensive coordinator coming in. Um, Dan Mullen was coming to us from a football power in Florida. Um, Joe Moorhead was coming to us from a football power in Penn State. I thought there were a lot of similarities. Um, the, the bottom line is um, I, you're constantly evaluating a football program uh, at all times. And in my evaluation of our football program, I, I needed to believe that we were trending in a certain direction. I needed to believe that we had an elite strength and conditioning plan. I needed to believe that um, we had the type of discipline it requires to, to lead kids in, in really one of the most difficult sports there is to lead kids in a sport where toughness matters, mm -hmm. um, where self-discipline on a daily uh, basis matters. Um, and and I, said, I just said this to you guys. That's a difficult thing to do, and you have to have the right fit to, to be able to pull that off. So, you know, in short, again, have, having to make some, some tough decisions, I think Joe Moorhead is going to be an elite coach. Just probably was not the right fit for Mississippi State, but I, you know, he's still a young man, and I think he's going to have a great coaching career. Well, my follow up to that is, um, like, I mean, honest, I'll be honest, as an alumni and even as a fan, I was kind of upset as far as, like, a lot of the leaks and things they got as far as how it was handled because I do feel like um, it embarrassed the program um, that it kind of got so much was out about what was going on. Obviously, the media is going to put out certain things that they hear, but it – I mean, even at the time, it felt almost like a reality show of the things that were out about Moorhead and why he got, was getting fired or why we're in this process. So – like, did you at any point maybe apologize to Moorhead for as how it was handled? Now, obviously, you made in a field a lot of people' opinion is the correct decision, but just how it kind of went down, um, was that something maybe you were upset yourself about just from an expectation level of the athletic director and how you're supposed to handle business? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I think pretty honest, open discussions the the whole time. Uh, you know, I I, I think you know, the 30 days of, of bowl preparation that we had. I spent a lot of time with, with Joe, with his staff, with our players, just evaluating, you know, not, not necessarily the looking over shoulder and looking for things that are going wrong, 
just evaluating, just having open and honest conversations. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the timing of it wasn't um, normal, but there's not much normal about college football, and there's not much normal about, um, you know, personnel decisions. Usually you can find some unique factors in every single personnel decision. So, um, you know, I, it was a tough situation to be in. I, I certainly love Joe. I love his family. I, I think they're outstanding people. And again, I, I think they all have a, a bright future. But I, I think when it came down to the evaluation process, fit is what, you know, what we were missing in that situation. Well, the best thing about his tenure is he went 2-0 and against a certain school up north. So we got all this from a fan perspective. That's important to me. And I kind of agree with Jeremiah was saying as far as, you know, it did kind of, you know, it, as a person from your standpoint, you don't want, you don't want leaks getting out. So, you know, I definitely agree with Jeremiah was saying that. Hey, hey Jay. Oh man, I thought that uh, he was getting ready to ask a question. All right. So, um, just wanted to comment. All right. So, we have the whole Joe Moorhead situation where, you know, Joe Moorhead goes after the bowl. And we already talked to uh, Coach Leach, and Coach Leach say he's chilling in Florida and he gets a call from Mississippi State. He thinks he's being trolled, and he's like, stop playing with me. So we end up with the pirate, uh, Mike Leach, coming in from Washington State University, Air Raid, Texas Tech, all that good stuff. Um, Gardner Minshew, we already know his reputation. So, as far as his prolific um, social media presence, was that something that you evaluated during the hiring process? Yeah, it certainly was. And we had discussions with uh, Coach Leach even, even before we came to any type of agree, agree, uh, agreement that certainly, you know, we, we wanted to address that very subject. Um, Coach Leach is a very smart man. He's a free thinker. Um, you know, he's somebody who has a law degree, you know, I, I mean, there's nothing, um, average or run of the mill about, uh, coach Mike Leach. He's different. He's exceptionally bright. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've hit a couple of bumps in the road, uh, for sure. But the one thing about Mike Leach is he's a lifetime learner. He mm -hmm. wants to know things. He, he will ask anybody anything to gain knowledge. And that's a very valuable attribute, especially as a head football coach at this level. So there's no doubt in my mind that, that Mike will continue to learn about Mississippi, continue to learn about Mississippi State, will continue to learn about his players. And, you know, guys, I know you know this, he hasn't had a practice yet with any of his players. And from my coaching background, I know that's when – you bond with your players is during practice when you're helping them improve and helping them get better, showing them your system, um, kind of revealing to them what has worked in the past for him, but also what's going to work for them as individuals. Um, they're going to see a, a different type of Mike Leach, but they just haven't had that bonding time. And, and you know, we're one of four schools in the SEC that has new coaches and I think all, all of them kind of feel the same way. They really haven't been able to practice with their players and, and, and get together with them. So I'm excited about that opportunity with Mike. And I, I think he's, I think he's going to do a terrific job here at Mississippi State. So were you intentional about maybe a lot of people have talked about Leach coming in and we had a former player, Dylan Robinson come on. He kind of talked about when Mississippi State throw the ball 40 times again, he's going to wait to see that if that actually happens, because it's really a true culture shift. Like, Really, the past 10 years, even though we run the spread offense, it's really the spread option is not based solely off the air rate. It's more of a running offense. So did you take that into consideration, bringing in the leech and really changing the culture of the program, making it more aggressive? Because as a coach, you were kind of a, seen as an intense, aggressive type of coach. So, so was that part of your thought process in bringing in a, a Mike Leach? Well, I will tell you guys, I had uh, several conversations with former players of Mike's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the one thing they kept saying is that Mike Leach and his staff does a great job as a disciplinarian, but at the same time allows mm -hmm. his players freedom and flexibility to make adjustments on their own. And to me, that's the ideal set of circumstances. The coach who sets a structure in place for discipline and for improvement 
on a daily basis. Let's be honest, guys. Your average 18 to 22 year old, no matter how disciplined they are, and I'm thinking about myself here, <laughs> the average 18 to 22 year old is not going to push themselves the way they need to be pushed to improve in every aspect of their lives. Thank God I had adult su supervision as an 18 to 22 year old and a coaching staff that said, I know you don't enjoy lifting weights or conditioning or running, but guess what? We're going to do it. I know you don't enjoy maybe going to class and pushing yourself academically, but guess what? Guess what? We're going to do it. This is a necessary component in the leadership of kids. But one of the things I learned from my baseball team, especially the 2013 team, is if you allow them to have make certain decisions for themselves <laughs> and make decisions, um, you're going to get a closer unit. You're, you're going to get a more productive group of student athletes. And, and Mike, I think, is way ahead of the curve on that. Um, and I think our players are going to see that again when they get an opportunity to, to go through practices with him. Well, I guess going with that, and you're talking about him bringing in more in a more disciplined approach. Uh, so I want to say you weren't surprised then that y'all did have a bit of a – one, there's attrition in every program every year. But in a sense, it kind of seemed a bit more high profile on Mississippi State because you had guys that were considered – one guy that was a starter last year and one guy was just projected not only maybe be a starter, but eventually be a star of the program. So were you not surprised then when those things start happening? Because normally when guys transfer, it's normally guys who were backups or guys that weren't projected to play much. So were you not surprised then when that started happening since Leach is coming in with a more disciplinarian type of approach? I, I think, you know, anytime you bring in a new coaching staff in any sport, there's, mm -hmm. there's going to be some transfers. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the case in almost any sport. Um, if you look at the transfer portal right now, you know, I mean, hey, to University of Alabama football, the players decided to come to Mississippi State. Mm -hmm. I don't know the reasoning. That's none of my business. But, you know, <laughs> is, that a, is that a negative toward the University of Alabama? I don't think so. I think, are, I think, they'll, be, I think they'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't see that as a negative in any way toward Alabama. So if, a, if we have a, some kids decide that with a new defensive approach at Mississippi State, a new type of defense, um, I, I can see kids, especially on that side of the football, saying, you know what, maybe I feel like there's a better situation for me somewhere else, whether they're a starter or not. So um, I'm a big believer that kids should get be able to make that decision. Heck, I made that decision 30-something years ago. I made that decision. I was a student at Birmingham Southern College, and I decided to transfer to Mississippi State University, and it changed my life. It was the best thing for me as an individual. Okay. Well, I have a facilities question because with you being a former player, coach, and now athletic director, you got a chance to see the change of duty and open field, you know, from now, from then to now. Uh, talk about that process and what are some other future facilities upgrades? Because we know facilities are the lifeblood of recruiting. So talk about your uh, future facilities plans and, of course, the dude. Yeah, the, the Duty Noble Field project to us it was, well, there, there were several factors. You know, we had to make our facility safe. And quite frankly, guys, it wasn't safe, especially the outfield portion of it. We had to make some, some adjustments there. I know that many of our fans enjoy our new left field lounge. Some of them say, boy, if we could just bring back the old days. Um, and I understand that, uh, that thought. Um, the facility itself at Duty Noble was – really important for us because guys it's going to generate revenue for the entire athletic department especially when we get to the 10-year mark it's going to generate a sum of money that's really going to help fund many of our other programs so you know i know people at this entire project was started by scott strickland not by john cohen in fact when he told me what he wanted to do i was shocked because we already had a nice facility it wasn't one of the nicest six baseball facilities in the SEC, but it was still, by a national standard, a pretty good facility. But what we have done now is put premium opportunities into our baseball facility, which allows us to create a revenue stream that will help support the rest of the entire athletic department, especially, again, after the 10-year mark. It's crucial for us to do something similar in the Humphrey Coliseum. The Humphrey Coliseum seating bowl, we're being told by all of our architects that is a phenomenal bowl. There's not really a bad seat in the house, but we need premium opportunities to generate revenue again to help promote our other 
programs. And in, in football, you know, we'd like to do something in the south end zone. You know, it's kind of an open-ended deal that has a field house effect to it in the south end zone. Um, we need to do something with that. We need to modify that also. All of this, of course, is predicated on, you know, when can we do it? And our plans have been a little altered because of COVID-19. How many fans will we be allowed to put in the stands? All those things are crucial elements as to when we can begin these projects. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned it because uh, that's the next thing <coughs> we were going to bring up. So tell me like your initial thought, like as an AD when that first comes down, obviously we have to worry about the first step. I mean, even though, of course, we, we're a sports show and we're talking about sports and I'm a former college student at Mississippi State, so obviously the education part is the most important, those students not being on campus, um, being educated. But talk about how you handle that as an AD, knowing that you're, you won't have spring baseball, so that's revenue that's coming in. You won't uh, have spring football, which you're installing, a, your team is installing a whole new offense. So what are some things, like, problem solving you were going through at that time to kind of work around it. Obviously you can't get that money back from baseball. So what is your thought process then kind of thinking about how are we going to re recoup this money and how are we going to be able to get our football team ready for the upcoming season? Yeah, we, um, we just feel like we have to make things a little leaner. Mm -hmm. um, we have to make sacrifices in order to make this work. We're very fortunate. Larry Templeton, the former AD at Mississippi's longtime AD, good friend, uh, Greg Burns, Scott Strickland, these guys did a great job of putting, you know, kind of together um, a rainy day fund, if you will, for emergencies just like we're experiencing right now. But if we don't have college football in the fall, and I'm optimistic that we will, but if for some reason we didn't, it would really alter our, our department financially, and we would have to continue to find ways to save money to offset what we're losing because we want to fund all of our programs at the highest level. We feel as though we're very competitive at the SEC level and nationally in almost all of our sports at this point in time. And that takes funding. And but if you want to be good in everything, and we do, um, we're going to have to have revenue streams. And one of the, the biggest revenue stream of them all is, as we all know, is college football. Well, speaking of revenue streams, um, sorry to cut, kind of back up here. We know one of our biggest revenue generating sports for the past couple of years has been women's basketball and we had a change of the guard so talk about you know uh the way you find out with Vic leaving and then the whole hiring process for coach McCray Pinson especially with COVID going on at the same time oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know uh, coach Schaefer decided to do something different uh in best interest for himself and for his family those are the decisions you have to make you know, it's really hard for me in, in any way, guys, to you know, be critical of, of Vic Schaefer. A, he did a great job at Mississippi State, but B, how ridiculous would that be? I'm the one who left Kentucky and a, and a great opportunity to come, Kentucky to come back to Mississippi State because I felt that was better for me. So obviously, Coach Schaefer feels like the Texas situation is better for him. So we're so fortunate that uh, Nikki McRae Penson was available. I, I think she is, I've never seen a resume in all of coaching like Nikki McRae Penson. Nikki McRae Penson has won 17 different championships as a player and a coach. And oh, by the way, she has worn USA across her chest and won two gold medals. She has separated herself as one of the elite recruiters in all of women's basketball. <laughs> She's a young woman who has a park named after her in her hometown in Tennessee, in Collierville, Tennessee. Um, you can't find people who can say negative things about Nikki McRae Penson because there's not a lot negative to say. I can't find anything negative to say. She is a bundle of energy. She is family oriented. She connects with the kids. She understands discipline. You know, and guys, she sat next to Pat Head Summit and Don Staley. I mean, I think about that. She sat next to or played for Pat Head Summit, who really invented women's basketball, and Dawn Staley, who I have the utmost respect for. Um, I, I don't think anybody's been more prepared to take over a program like ours than Nikki McCray Penson. I didn't swear any better, Coach. I said she had you at hello. <laughs> 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 Sounds like she pretty much 
<laughs> that was your uh, Kawhi Leonard moment. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jeremiah, did you want to do next question or what? Well, I guess we're transitioning COVID. You kind of addressed that, and um, obviously it's just tough for everybody. So, I mean, I don't think it's really much you can add there. But now we're kind of in the current situation, and you have the Black Lives Matter movement. Obviously, being the athletic director of a program, we have many African American athletes. Let's talk about kind to being able to handle that. Because obviously, it's when we've talked about it on the show and off the air, uh, me and some of the guys have kind of discussed it's almost like you're not even allowed not to have a response. Uh, we dance back and forth about whether that's fair. So, talk about you know how you handle it and what have you really counseled the coaches on? I mean, they're grown men or grown women, but what have you counseled them on as far as like being careful about what they say? Because obviously, as we know from the Mike Leach tweet that what they do is gonna affect the whole program. So um, first, let's talk about your initial response to everything, and then talk about like what have you counseled the coaches on how they should you know conduct themselves. Well, guys, I'm I don't consider myself an expert in this area. I I want to be like Coach Leach in the fact that I want to be a lifelong learner, <clears throat> and I feel like I continue to learn about all of this. The thing that I know, and the thing that I've expressed to our coaches, and we've had many, many, many head coaches meetings. Uh, we've had focus groups <clears throat> with our department with student athletes, and we've had focus groups with our staff. Um, I, I can share with you, it's been emotional. It's been a coming together that, that quite frankly, might not have happened. So I, I feel privileged and that we've had some things come together, and I have been able to be educated in a way that, quite frankly, I wasn't educated fully before. And this is what I know and my message to our coaches. There is a difference. It's not good enough to simply not be a racist. We have to be against racism. And they're two different things. And when you grow up in the Deep South, you understand this. And it's very important to me for us to distinguish between that. And I want John Cohen, I want my entire family, I want my entire athletic department family, I want to be against racism, not simply just not a racist. And that requires education, it requires listening, and it requires not checking something off on a list and saying, well, that's over, we're gonna move on to this thing. It's something that has to happen every single day, every week. You know, if you wanna liken it to football, you know, there's not a coach out there that's gonna say, okay, we're going over special teams today, and." We're going to check that off the list, and now we're not going to go over special teams anymore the rest of the whole football season. No, you can't do that. It's got to be something that's every single day. And we're committed to that at Mississippi State University to listen, to make the experience better for our student athletes, for all of them, but to listen to our student athletes of color, to listen to our staff of color, and, and to listen to their suggestions, to listen to their thought process, and, and to make it better for everyone. Okay. Well, uh, well I'm just going to add quickly to what he was going to say. Coach, I, I mean, I kind of wanted to commend you as far as, um, I mean, I'm, I'm almost, I respect more the fact that you didn't use the fact of, like with your family, that your family in a sense, in itself proved that you're inclusive, but you didn't go out and say, I mean, your wife stated it on, you know, social media, but you didn't use that as your qualifier for saying that your statement. So that kind of adds a lot of weight to what you're saying. You're not saying it as somebody just trying to, be the AD and say that you're against it. In a sense, just in a sense, how you run your family suggests that you're not that way. So I, just, I appreciate that you didn't really actually use that. That shows that it's not something that you're trying to use as a qualifier for your statement. Well, that's one of the things I have to make a point to my family at home is that this is not about us. Mm. Okay. It, it's about Black Lives Matter. It's about the African American community. It is about inclusiveness. It's not about us. The best thing we can do is listen at this point, mm -hmm. not, not project ourselves out there. So Nell and John Cohen had some very interesting conversations. Um, and I am proud of Nell and I am proud of my children. Um, I feel incredibly fortunate. My children have surrounded themselves with outstanding people. And that's what you try and teach your kids to do. So I'm awfully proud of them, but I'm awfully proud of my Mississippi State family as well. All right. So there are a couple of things that I want to go ahead. And since we have you here and we're getting to the end of the interview, yay. Um, go ahead and get on the record. So 
uh, Greg Sankey decided to make things very interesting yesterday by saying that they're considering uh, not having SEC championships in the state of Mississippi while we still had a flag. So while we have you here, we just want to get your uh, thoughts on the record as far as the Mississippi flag and, you know, if they need to change or not so that we can um, stop having this economic impact against our state because, you know, we can't have – NCAA um, games that aren't on campus or whatnot. And then if we possibly have with the SEC, um, that also, you know, what needs to be done? Well, it's a really simple thing for me. Um, I know that the flag is offensive to a large portion of the state of Mississippi. It should be offensive to all of us in, in several different ways. Um, and if it's offensive to African-Americans and it should be offensive to all Americans, because it, it kind of represents a, a time that, you know, we want to separate ourselves from. Uh, we, this is the, the greatness of our country, in my opinion, is that we have the ability to adjust. We have the ability to move on. We have the ability to learn from the past. And we have the opportunity through the Constitution of the United States to constantly make improvements with every part of our society. And I think this is an opportunity to make an improvement. I fully support the president of this great university, Mark Keenum, um, with his statements. Um, we believe that the time has come for there to be a new flag in the state of Mississippi. Um, I, I have had people reach out to me and say, it, it doesn't really mean anything, it's just a symbol. Well, we're all aware of the fact, symbols matter. It great. matters. And, and, and we're, the, the one thing about the potential of losing opportunities to host on our campus, whether it's the Southeastern Conference events or anything else, it, it bothers me that it can affect student athletes and it can affect staff members, coaches who really have nothing to do with the flag. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that bothers me. Now, having said that, I am in total agreement with the statements of our commissioner and I agree with him. And if I was the commissioner of the Southeastern conference, which thank goodness for everybody, I'm not, but if I was the commissioner of the Southeastern conference, I would have done the same thing. All right. And so the second thing that I wanted to ask about is, uh, I know that you're a baseball guy and I'm a, I'm a baseball guy too. I, uh, sat there in Applebee's down here in Brandon, Mississippi, and I watched the, uh, 2013 college world series and I wept as uh, we lost in straight games in the championship series against the UCLA Bruins. I could, that, that national championship was so close that I could taste it, but you know, whatever. So- Are you trying to make me cry? Are you trying I, to get me upset? It was, it was I, I, I know. every day, partner. I, I know, I was, I was in Memphis. I was staying at the Tunica Road House Hotel and I watched every game in its entirety. And I went to a Memphis Redbirds game and I was like, oh, it'll be fine. And then I got back and we were losing and I was just like, oh my God, I jinxed this. So, um, no, it's your fault. I can blame you there. It yeah, is. Blame it's, Arthur. It's really my fault. <laughs> it, it really is. Just like the egg bowl, the first egg bowl that I, I'd never gone to an egg bowl. The one egg bowl that I did go to, we lost. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to the egg bowl no more. So one <laughs> of the ongoing topics on this, um, podcast is about the baseball team. A lot of us love the baseball team. And, you know, we're talking about Black Lives Matter. We're talking about inclusion. We're talking about coaching and things like that. And one of the things that comes up is the fact that we're in Mississippi. And, you know, sometimes you will see like a few years ago when we were in the regional at University of Louisiana Lafayette and they were the number one team in the country, lost to Jackson State. We lost to Jackson State, I think, um, this season, last season, one of those seasons. And so obviously there are a lot of black baseball players who can play. You look at the, the uh, MLB, the major leagues, and you see lots of African-American baseball players. But every year consistently on Mississippi State's baseball team, there's like one or two black guys, you know. So if you were to look at a team like Vanderbilt, uh, who just won the national championship, or the University of Michigan, you see a very diverse group of players Meanwhile, you look at Mississippi State's baseball team and, you know, they look like 
you know, a bunch of guys who were playing back in 1950s or something like that. And so, call me crazy. Uh, within the black community, one of the things is that, like, well, you know, I think that it would help if we had more athletic players, i.e. black players, on the team. Uh, because it just seems as though that when we go up against Vanderbilt, it's like, oh, my God, there is a distinct athleticism deficit. So I guess that what I'm trying to say is that a lot of the black fans feel as though that there needs to be a concerted effort to get more minorities onto the baseball team. And I'm not saying that you guys aren't looking for them, but it would just make us feel better. So um, oh, <laughs> what <laughs> – what do you have to say to that, you know, for the black fans? Because a lot of us are watching and we're kind of like, you know, we would feel better if there were more of us. Like, how do we have this whole baseball team full of guys and we have no black guys on the team? You know, guys, you bring up a really interesting question, and I'm, I'm glad that you are bringing it up because I'm on the Division One baseball committee and I've had conversations about this. Um, the way college baseball is set up, guys, with the scholarship structure in place the way it is, it's not competitive scholarship-wise with other sports. So if, if I'm looking for the best scholarship opportunity and I'm a great athlete, basketball is going to offer a full scholarship. Football is going to offer a full scholarship. Baseball has 27 guys sharing 11.7 scholarships. Um, we have signed many African-American players at Mississippi State who ended up signing professional contracts before they got to Mississippi State. Um, and I, I don't blame the kids. It's a better financial situation for them or their families, depending on their family background, uh, to sign a professional contract. Um, so you can't blame the kids for taking the professional option. But even as kids, when, when you're, you look at the opportunity to maybe even go to junior college and play basketball or football and be on a full scholarship or go to a Mississippi State to play baseball and be potentially on a 30 or 40 percent scholarship, you know, I think there's some economics. Um, you bring up some other schools that have more diversity and, you know, there, there are things, there are structures in place, in my opinion, that allow that to happen. And I would love for those structures to be in place for Mississippi State from a scholarship perspective to, for us to be able to make, make significant changes and to have more uh, of a presence, a diversity presence on our baseball team. It's something that I've talked about with Coach Lamonas. He's in total agreement with that. Um, this is not a Mississippi State issue, guys. It's a structure of college baseball issue. And when you look at some of the most influential Americans in terms of race relations or civil rights in the history of this country, one of those people is Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. who was a college athlete who changed forever the way we view things in Major League Baseball. Um, I, I want things to be better in college baseball I'm not sure in terms of diversity, it has gotten better. And I think there are things that can be done. Uh, there are structures that can be changed and created to help college baseball in terms of diversity. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. And so, to make a point, ahead. Coach Lamonis has, I don't have their names in front of him, but he has been recruiting black players. I think he has, what, two or three committed right now. So maybe, you know, his administration uh, could focus on that. But but I do agree with what you're saying, so with foster structure. And that's so, a big difference between baseball guys and football and basketball, too. High school kids can't be drafted out of the, by the NBA, and they can't be drafted at this point in the NFL. But Major League Baseball can pluck some of the premier baseball players mm -hmm. um, anytime they choose to. And when, you're, and when you've got somebody on the, the 40 or 50 percent scholarship, Man, that, that's, that's tough. Uh, and that's what every college baseball coach goes through every single year with the draft. And just kind of piggyback on what you're saying, Coach Cohen, it's something that I guess a lot of people in the African-American community talk about, but um, a lot of commentators even talk about the fact that, I mean, as a kid, I grew up, it was easy for us to get up and play basketball. I wasn't a basketball guy. We can get a football and get 10 guys together, but decide you want to play baseball is nine positions. Somebody has to pitch. 
you know, having to learn how to feel is a highly skilled sport. So I do think, and baseball is just not as cool. I mean, so it's, I, I think there are some dynamics that I think will fix it. So and I'm glad that you mentioned about the financial component of it. And baseball doesn't have the full scholarships. So I think that is a component. I mean, obviously, there could be more of an effort. So what could be some tangible things that could be done, like a structure that has been discussed that would facilitate being able to have more African-American players, um, although you don't have the scholarships, maybe will you allow to have more minorities on your teams? Yeah, I, again, I, I think it starts with being competitive financially with the opportunities that all kids are going to get, African-Americans, white kids. The scholarship aid is the biggest factor. It is the currency in which mm. you show interest in a student athlete. And again, what's different is in football, every football player gets a full scholarship as they well should, mm -hmm. but there's not a competitive thing where you go, okay, here at uh, Mississippi State, we're going to offer a football player 70% and then they're going to go to LSU and get 80%. No, it, they're, they're identical scholarships. They're full scholarships. Um, the baseball thing is a little bit of a bidding situation and the amount that you offer the, the young person, the potential student athlete, is what they might perceive to be your interest level, which isn't always the truth either, because you're trying to put a team together. You know, there's so many times where I would tell uh, a student athlete that we're recruiting in baseball, they'd say, well, coach, you know, you're offering me 50%, and this school over here is offering me 80%. And I would say to them, hey, you're a pitcher. How important is your catcher to you? And they're like, well, my goodness, my catcher is critical to, to my success. I said, well, we got to give them scholarships too so that you can be your best. All of this works together. So it's complicated. Baseball is complicated. It shouldn't be, but unfortunately it is complicated. And we're absolutely committed at Mississippi State to creating more of a presence of diversity in that sport. But in my opinion, and, and being on the Division I Baseball Committee, which was really charged with the championships and, and the tournament, um, I would love for the discussion of how do we create more diversity in college baseball? Because I think Major League Baseball is very interested in that concept as well. So as we kind of um, move to our closing out, I know you're a busy man. Um, talk about kind of like, the duality of kind of handling two big problems. It seems like problems sometimes come and then you have to deal with something else. But right now you kind of have COVID-19 and we had, I think, four players that's positive. I might have the number wrong. And then obviously you have Black Lives Matter, which is essentially a ongoing topic right now. So talk about as an AD, you're, in a sense, you're hired to handle problems, but this, these are two big ones right now as far as sensitive topics, not necessarily problems, but very, have a very sensitive nature where things can go wrong if you do, you do the wrong thing, whether it's with COVID, or with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. So talk about how you're appropriately trying to deal with both of those, knowing that anything going wrong, like we mentioned the leech tweet. Now, I kind of thought to mention, like, I'm sure you're glad as an AD that that didn't happen right about now. I mean, just with the sensitive nature of everything going on. So talk about having to handle both of those huge, very sensitive issues. Well, as an athletic director. of course, COVID's a very new thing, at least to right. most of us. We're not epidemiologists. Um, it's a very new thing to us, and we're learning every little thing about this virus and potential, potential future viruses and everything else. Um, there's nothing new about racism, guys. Um, that, that's been around mm. for a long time. And I, I think the lesson we learned with current events in our country is we need to be more prepared. We need to be more educated. We need to listen more. We need to have more action items, more tangible things in front of us. And quite frankly, I, I view the flag as one of those things. It's a tangible item that the people of the state of Mississippi can insist upon uh, changing. Um, so again, one of them's really new and it's frightening because we don't know anything about it. One of them's not really new. It's equally frightening because we do know something about it. And the, the one thing we know is that things have to change with both of those items. They have to change. And we, we're absolutely committed uh, to changing the way we think about both of those uh, issues that you mentioned. Hey, All right. So uh, that brings us to the end of this particular episode of uh, the Black Dog Sports Podcast. From the dog's mouth with Mr. John Cohen. 
Uh, let me go ahead and get the thoughts of the guys before we head out. Jeremiah, you got anything on your mind? Um, just want to thank uh, John for coming on. I almost called him Coach Cohen. Uh, John for coming on and answering these questions. I know some of these things aren't easy to answer, and then also just giving us that amount of time because I know time is very imperative, really, for your job and just at the current moment. So thanks for coming on. All right. Um, Derek? Well, I just want to thank you for coming on, and you're welcome to come back anytime to talk sports with us. Hey, let's let's do it again, guys. I enjoyed it. I, I appreciate your thoughts. I appreciate your creativity. Um, and I, I do want to tell you this. We're all in this thing together. And, and I appreciate you as being part of the Mississippi State family having me on your show today. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm touched. All right. So um, normally this would be a part where I say praise the Lord and go dogs. But, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, we had a family. It's like going through a divorce, you know what I'm saying? So Coach McCray. To tell Coach McCray that it is imperative that she comes up with some type of catchphrase for us to use on this show. But since I can't say that, um, well, let me see. Is there something? Oh, I want to say happy Juneteenth to everybody. Okay, I got on with Dashiki and everything. We, uh, Coach Cohen, we need to work on getting a maroon and white one. As a matter of fact, maroon and black. It'll be even better. All right? <laughs> so, um, okay. yeah. And also, we need a national championship. And that's about it. Okay, bye-bye. Holler at y'all later. Peace out.